Hi, welcome back to Memory Protection. It's an Apple News podcast set 20 years ago. Today, we're looking back to July 2001. I'm Josh McGrath. Uh, hi. Whoa. Josh, joined, watch out. I'm, I, I'm joined by my co host, Matt, Matt Smith. Oh, my head. God, stop. Oh, there's cameras. There's cameras flying hey. everywhere. Okay, we're, we're here at, at Macworld. Uh, we're here at Macworld 2001. Oh, God. And uh, uh, we're in, it's New York. Steve Jobs has gone crazy. He's throwing cameras everywhere. He's just got a box of cameras and he's throwing them at he's the audience. He's just beaming people with digital camcorders. We gotta get out of here, Josh. He's just no. So far, I've managed to. Oh, 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 oh. Hey, God, that Sony, that Sony technology really packs a wallop. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, that's got to be a three megapixel camera right there. It's huge. <laughs> oh, you, can, you can really feel the megapixels. <laughs> Let's get into the quick time machine, Josh. Welcome to the quick time machine. Strap in. Wow, 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 wow. Oh, I forgot I forgot to put in the crystals. <laughs> oh, we didn't go anywhere. I made the noises for no reason. <laughs> you you got to put the crystals in the drawer. First on the QuickTime machine docket. Apple Works updated for OS X. Womp, womp, so womp, Apple, womp. Apple Works gets updated to version 6.2. This is the first time Apple Works is compatible with OS X. People are pumped. And it has a lot of compatibility with Office. Yeah, boom. Next, Thai books at Target. Mm. Well, Thai books advertising Target. Yes, Target is using titanium iBooks or titanium power books rather to advertise their new website, even though they don't sell much Mac software at Target. Yeah, I think this is kind of interesting. We we've talked a couple times about Apple's sort of advertising cachet, right? With the what is what was that movie you were watching? Oh, Julia three, three movies. Movie. Three. Uh, I was watching a bunch of movies, rom coms, whatnot. All three of them used Macs at you know different time periods, but you know throughout the nineties and early aughts, all Macs. Hmm. Well, you mentioned one of them was Notting Hill, right? No, it was. Uh, it, it was my best friend's wedding. The road to El Dorado. <laughs> road to El Dorado. That was weird. Uh, I want to say Charlie's Angels. Yes, it was I think a J Lo music video that had one too. Hmm. Then the wedding planner. The, yeah, the Matthew McConaughey. And the wedding planner, I think she has an iMac G3. Nice. And, my, and in my best friend's wedding, Julie Roberts has a power book. She says the word power book. In. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that went nowhere. Uh, you know what else is going nowhere, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> the Power Mac G4 Cube. They're going right. to get it one day. They're going to figure yeah. this out. They're going to figure out how to put a computer in a cube. Mm. I believe yeah, in but them. It's, it's not in July of 2001 because Apple... You know, they took a little break. They took a little break. They said, why don't we put a computer in a tube? Yeah. And that was maybe worse than usual. We we did a cube. We did a tube. <laughs> we can do a rectangle. We can yeah, do we a can big do a rectangle. Slab. We can do a, a small rectangle. We can even do a, a, a real little rectangle. Yeah. Cannot do a cube, though. No. No cube, no tube. That's what I always say. You know, Matt, customers, cube customers love their cube. Mm. But many, many Apple customers chose to buy the G4 instead. I mean, for the price, it's probably a safer bet, right? You get a, you get a, uh, probably what is a faster computer, you know, uh, more expandability, future proofing. I mean, the cube is a, cube is a beautiful design object, but. A lot of that cost goes into that design and not into the feature set. Right. Well, and, and the and the engineering. Got to pay for that engineering. Yes. And uh, yes. So is the fate of many other strangely shaped Apple computers. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. It's been uh, just about exactly one year since they introduced it. This, yes. was, uh, this is our July episode of last year where we talked about the cube with uh, Stephen. <clears throat> yes. Moment of silence for the cube. All right. Well, anyway, <laughs> Apple updates Mac OS X ser- server. Uh, server. I thought it was Mac OS X. Mac OS X server. <laughs> Mac OS X server. Server. To 10.0.4. It's all sorts of great features in this one. Mm, like what? Well, of 
course, Mac OS 10 Server 10.0.4 delivers reliable performance improvements for the Apple file protocol connection. Mm. Printer sharing, FTP, mm. mail, and directory services. I'm just uh, just to, just to name some things off the top of my head. Yeah, I mean, the list is so long. It also includes MySQL and security updates to Samba. Samba is uh, actually features a few times in this episode, I think, right? I think so. Yeah, they they made. Um, I think it comes to well, they demo it in ten point one because I don't think it's in ten point oh the consumer release. Is that right? Or maybe it is, and they improved it. I can't remember that. It was a long keynote. We'll get there. We ran a, 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 a OS ten server at the uh, student development shop I worked in at, oh. uh, during college. Do you have an X serve? I think we did. Uh, a friend of the show, Zev Eisenberg, was in charge of uh, managing that. Well, Zev can let us know what uh, what hardware you all had. Right in, Zev. Uh, last on the list, Aspire brings the Sims to Mac OS X. Aspire, classic long-running porter of uh, Mac games to varying degrees of success. You play The Sims? Were you a Sims guy? I was not. It? I was not. Although the, I, I in college, I played. Uh, I, I played a lot of their port of Civ Five. Okay, the Aspire port. Yes, specifically yeah. that. Yeah, I was yeah. happy to see them here. It's one of those. Yeah, I that that's one of the, the neat things about uh, the game game porters is they're very long lived. I've realized doing this show. Yeah, yeah. I was I was surprised too. I, I mean. I guess I'm I'm not entirely surprised. I remember seeing them back in the day, but I guess I I think I'm more surprised in 2021 knowing that they're still around, still doing the same work. And it's cool. Nice job, Aspire. Well, that that's the thing. They're they're a bit unsung, right? But they're yeah. they're uh, they're steady. Right. They're doing that hard work. <laughs> they're are you getting those games to run on computers that no one wants to make games run on <laughs> without even the help of web of game sprockets. Right. Sure. No thanks to Apple. We move on to our main topic for the month, which is, of course, Macworld, New York, 2001, taking place on July 18th. It was a Wednesday. It was a night just like tonight. In the hook... Was stuck in the car. Car door hook hand. The, ca- the call was coming from inside the Jacob Javits conven- Convention Center. And suddenly, the the shadowy figure raised up his hand, and Threw there was a the digital there was a, camera in the audience. <laughs> yeah. I promise we're going to explain that soon. If you don't already know what we're talking about. It might be the it might be the primary topic of tonight's episode. Oh, uh, it's, it's certainly a, a point of fascination for Matt and I. Yeah. Yes, we're talking about MacWorld, <clears throat> Steve Jobs' keynoter in chief. Yeah, that's his title. He changed <laughs> it again. It's not. He was I CEO, and then it's CEO, and now it's keynoter in chief. <laughs> Keynotist. <laughs> keynoter Republic. Key- there you go. <laughs> uh and uh, let's go shopping, Matt. I I love shopping. Who doesn't love shopping? Get in. You know what? It's 2001. Josh, let's go to the mall. Let's go to the mall. (laughs) That's right. Apple Apple is getting into the retail business. So so we've been talking about retail for a long time during the course of the show. But so correct me if I'm wrong, Matt. But these Apple stores, starting in May, and in particular with these ones, these are the these are the beginning of what we think of as Apple stores, right? Correct. Yeah. So these would be the okay. first two Apple retail stores, Apple owned and operated retail stores. Everything else up until this point has been like a partner supply chain kind of thing. Apple hasn't had its own individual first party stores. Right, right, right. Okay. And uh, so Steve explains a little bit about how they're going to work. And then he shows us a video where he gives us a, a tour in person of yeah. one of these, uh, of a, of a uh, Glendale location, right? Yep. Yeah. And it, and, he, and it's, you know, I think if you've been to an Apple store at any point in the last 20 years, this tour will look familiar because... That struck me so much. I was like, wow, this looks like an Apple store. Right. And and certainly the details have changed, but I think that the the sort of like overall vision for what Apple retail is has been 
pr- was codified pretty early on. Like that, the minimalism is the same. The sort of like uh, light colored wood aesthetic mm-hmm. is still is there even in the beginning. Yep. Um, you know the the chairs, like the stools, even look the same. I think right. Yeah. Um, the biggest difference I noticed was, uh, which I'm pretty sure was is actually a difference, <laughs> is the shelves of uh, software. Yeah, the 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 big box retail <laughs> software. Yeah. yeah, which was like it made me a little melancholy because I was like, oh, that looks so cool. I used to love looking at shelves of software. Yeah, same, same. Get to go into a Babbage's and check out all the computer software. Hell yeah! To be like, ooh, there's a SimCity, a new, new SimCity. Maybe no. maybe my computer can run it. Oh, look, it's The Sims for Mac. Oh, Quicken. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve gives us a, a tour of this store, uh, you know, uh, including all of the above, and then a, a rear projection screen for showing demos of OS X and mm-hmm. various other software. And, and I think they sort of hint that hinted that you could watch Apple events in the in the stores. And I know that's something that they went on to do. Is if they had a keynote, you could. It go sort to of reminded me of uh, of um, I'm I'm blanking on the name of the previous uh, like. Uh, Retail VP from Apple. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the plan for the, like the Apple like uh, town squares and whatnot. Is it Angela Arons? Is that and Angela Arons? Yes, thank you. I don't remember what what her plan for the retail was. I, it's it was been... it was like it was like this, but like like but like times a thousand. Okay. Yeah, like this idea that like oh the Apple Store is like a place you gather and you're gonna watch things and you know take classes and it's like I think I'm somewhat. Uh, suspicious of that only because in Maine we have one Apple store and it's very small mm-hmm. <laughs> and I can't imagine any of this happening there. Now this very, things like this may very well happen at the more, you know, the higher scale, bigger Apple stores. I'm not sure. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, how, how many Apple stores have you been to Josh? Uh, three. Which one hit, hit me with them? Uh, um, uh, okay. Uh, uh, I've been to Portland, Maine. Yeah. I think I didn't go there until like 2010. Yeah. When I got my iPhone 4S. Pro Max. Those dates probably do not match up. I'm sorry. But um, so it's right around there. I don't remember the dates, but. I think that's 2011. Uh, is the 4S. I've been to the one in New York in the train station. Yeah. And I've been to one in Paris. Oh, nice. I think we can all agree that the main one is the most exotic one. Yeah. It's the, the most remote. <laughs> <laughs> Truly remote. <laughs> Truly mysterious. Probably the hardest, the hardest one to get to. Mm. Yeah, I think I've been to. Uh, I I can been to a bunch, but I've been to obviously the main. Uh, been to the North Shore, which we'll talk about in a minute. We'll talk about, or I've been to Boston. I've been to New York, the Grand Central. I don't think I've been to the Cube. I've been to San Francisco, and I've been to one in Michigan. I've been to two in Michigan, actually. Damn, I'm a connoisseur. You've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere. You're like a DVD menu. (laughs) So getting back on track here, results have been terrific. These two stores are performing beyond expectations. Um, Terrific. Terrific. So terrific that Apple's going to open four more stores in August. Um, I didn't actually write down which ones they were other than the one in the North Shore Mall in um, Danvers, Massachusetts, because that's the one... I was, that's the first Apple store I went to. And, and I actually went to the opening of this Apple store. This was the sixth Apple store. Oh, wow. Ever opened. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've told me about this. Yeah. So I remember I I told you, I think it was not too long ago that I, I I went, I knew it was happening and I waited in line, borrowed my then girlfriend, now wife's car. And I went out there and I waited in line for like two hours. I I got a t-shirt. I checked it out for about a half an hour and I left. It was fun. Did you buy anything? I was broke. (laughs) <laughs> you got a t-shirt though. Yeah, I got a free t-shirt. Uh, oh, so I think I asked you, 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 you don't have the t-shirt anymore, right? No, it did not. It was, well, one, it was like an extra large and, uh, yeah. Big it was Mac. Big Mac. It was, uh, it didn't last long. It wasn't a great t-shirt. Sleep shirt. The one with the curry stains. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Stuff it on TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's Wednesday. <laughs> Oh, uh, so, you know, we're talking, going back to the video and, and Steve Jobs sort of touring the Apple store. This is, I think, I think the Apple store had exactly one 
layout because the North Shore Apple Store looked exactly like the one oh, did Steve it, demoed. Did it. Yeah, no, I, I think they were in the beginning. They were all the same, and and I'm pretty sure the main one looked like that one as well. Well, I mean, like, it's still. I was looking at this video. I was like, yeah, this is pretty much what it looks like. Yeah, today they've got they've got they've got more tables instead of software shelves. Yes, exactly. Yeah, more tables for. Uh, Various power uh, MacBook Pros and whatnot. Yeah. Now, but of course, there's something in the back of these stores, sort of a main feature of these stores, which was introduced today. What is that? I think this is sort of the Apple Store's secret weapon. It's the Genius Bar. Mm-hmm. The first uh, mention. If you've, if you've ever gone to an Apple Store, like you, the the reason you might actually need to go to an Apple Store ever is because... Like, you, for instance, if your AirPods kept uh, unpairing from your phone. Oh, is that a thing that's happening to you, John? Yeah, I might need to go to the Genius Bar so they can tell me to buy new AirPods. I mean, they're probably way out of warranty at this point, right? They're, they're literally the first ones, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I was a little bit, I I, uh, I I wasn't prepared for this. I didn't realize that this was going to be the Genius Bar uh, introduction. Um, so that was kind of fun to, to hear. And uh, I remember, I was thinking back to, I remember what a joke this phrase was. Which uh, joke? Just like, oh, it's the genius bar, you know, and, you know, there's plenty of hay to be made there, right? Sure. Um, but I was reflecting on that and thinking about how um, I don't think about this phrase anymore. And I don't, that I was talking about with my wife and she was, she was agreeing like, yeah, it's just, that's what they call it, right? Right. It's not really, a, it's not really funny anymore. Well, and I think, I think maybe the reason for that is because uh, it's actually really useful. Right. Sure. Like, the, like the, the the concept, like the the usefulness of the concept is is really pretty great. Like the thinking about like um, you know, a a, com- a computer manufacturer. Like like imagine if a Compaq opened up the Compaq store, so well, you could buy Compaq computers. Yes. Yeah. And you could trust them to take care of their com- computers, right? Right. Of course. Um, but of course, yeah. that's not what happens. It's OEMs, and the OEMs sell like through like. Best Buy and the best you can hope for is like the Geek Squad or something or yeah, just some if, random third you, party. Only or, if you buy that. I mean, there are Microsoft protection. stores, but do they do this? I, you know, I don't, I don't know. And, 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 and to be, and those are be, fairly new. Yeah. And to be fair, they, they, they very well may, like, I, I, I don't doubt that they have some sort of support system in place. I think especially after Apple sort of proved this model, but um, I think it's, it's pretty, pretty novel to, to sort of like, not only have the place where to buy the stuff, right, but right. also have a support system in place for when that stuff starts to break. Um, and I and, have used it before. I have. I, I've. I. Uh, <laughs> I brought. I brought my uh, coffee besodden 2017 MacBook Pro to mm-hmm. the Genius Bar to have them sort of look at me forlornly. <laughs> yep. And say, "I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about your luck. <laughs> There's nothing we can do." <laughs> <laughs> so I, I yeah i was i was gonna ask you about what your experience with the genius bar was is that is that your primary experience i don't actually have that many apple store experiences because a lot of what i need to do is just purchasing a new device i mm-hmm. think mm-hmm. and that happens often at a uh at a, a carrier store right i'm not sure that i've ever purchased a computer at a, an apple store live so i have done that Two time purchase two computers. Two computers. Two computers. Help computer. So the this, this what, was, what happened? What happened? <laughs> I was in grad school at the time, and 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 uh, I, the first time I bought uh, an iBook. So my grad school experience, I I, I did. Well, I, let's be clear. I, I bought two computers and an iPod in grad school. That's the most I've ever bought from an Apple store in a short span of time. Um, I bought a, I bought an iBook my, my first year of of school and, uh, my second year of school, the CD drives crapped out on. So I I brought it into the genius bar. Not so super. What's that? Not so super. Well, it wasn't a super drive. It was just so combo. (laughs) It wasn't even a combo drive. (laughs) (laughs) I bought the base model iBook. Um, so I, so I, CD drive started crapping out and, and it was still under warranty. It was still within a year. And I, I brought it in and I said, here's the deal. And they said, yeah, this kind of sucks. Um, I, I th- Well, to be fair, I think it, it may have just gone out of warranty. And this is where Steve's introduction to uh, what is known as the red phone caught my eye. Mm, the red phone. We need to bring this up. Yeah. So the red phone, Steve intros the red phone. And he says, if, if we can't solve your problem in the store, we've got the red phone. 
and it's a direct line to Cupertino. And that's pretty much all he says. It's so, dubious, right? It's so it is dubious, except for the fact that I brought my thing in. I brought my my broken iBook in just out of warranty and said, "Look, I I've had this for just under or just over a year. It just ran out of warranty, and the CD drive broke. Can you help?" And they said, "Let me go to the red phone." <gasps> what? He, he turns around, picks up this red phone I didn't even see was there. Literally. Start speaking to somebody. I said, here's the deal. I've got a customer. His computer is just out of warranty. His CD drive is broken. How can we help him? And they said, yeah, let's do it. Let's Amazing. It was, it was incredible. I, like, it, was like, it was like Batman wow. getting a call from Commissioner Gordon. <laughs> uh, so he hung, hangs and he says, okay, thanks. He hangs up the phone. He says, uh, if you're good, we'll take your computer. We'll send it back to Apple. Um, you're not going to have to pay for this because it sucks that your computer broke less than a month out of warranty. We'll take care of it for you. It was wild. Like Honor was there. I'm sure she could attest to it, but like it was really cool. And Apple, Apple isn't always great about, or not always bad about it, but like, I think the sort of like early on, like the let's, yeah. let's give them the best customer experience we possibly can. Even if it means like us taking a little bit on the chin, like, you know, like, and, and it just felt like it felt like they were interested in doing doing mm. the right thing or the human thing as so, opposed so to I, the business thing. I have a record about that, which is I know this is very <clears throat> this is the most anecdotal you could be. But I feel yeah. like there were there used to be more stories like this. Mm -hmm. Like I remember friends, you know, their their whole laptop crapped out. You know, they go to the Apple store and it's like they just replaced it. Right. Yeah. Stories like that. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if that still happens, but that because there's so much more volume, yeah, so many more customers, it's just a smaller percentage of the time, right? That's probably true. So it gets a little bit diluted. For sure. I don't have any data to back that up. It's just my reckon, as I say. Yeah. Um, but, you know, back in those hey, that the, the sort of mid-aughts heyday, it, f it, it felt like Apple was a lot more willing to... Um, to do to to as you say, just sort of take it on the chin and 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 create not just a a good experience, but like a you know loyalty. You yeah. Know? No. Oh, for sure. Yeah, because that totally. That, I mean, it totally won me over, and it. I think it totally won Honor over, and she was not interested in computers. I think she was impressed with like, wow, they really they really did the right thing. Right. Right. Um, That's so cool. Yeah. It was it was a really good customer experience. I honestly. Okay. I'm, I'm sort of, this is, I'm sort of remembering now. Like I, yeah, I, I, I heard stories like that and, and I had experiences like that in college. So like fast forward to my, you know, I spilled, uh, I did not spill coffee on my computer. My cat did. This is a 2017, uh, 2017 touch bar MacBook pro 13 inch hmm. dead. I brought that in and there was a small part of me that was like, maybe I'll go up to the genius bar and the person up there will be like, wow, this sucks. We're we'll going to replace the, it. We'll give you the red phone experience. Yeah, we'll give you the red phone. But of course, red phones don't exist anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know when they when they took them According out. According to Wikipedia, after 2009, they were not found in stores. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. But I'm not so sure about the primary source on that, but that's one data point for you. Hmm. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I have, I mean, thinking about that, that's maybe my best customer experience. Um, with the Genius Bar, and I, and I have had, a, had other great customer experiences, but that one really stands out. Like uh, I had a 2010 MacBook Pro that I think I think the the Logic Board died, um, and they replaced that, but it was still under Apple Care Plus, like we or the extended Apple Care warranty. So that, you know that was part of it, right? Uh, but but I think similarly. Oh, I'm sorry. That was what was, that's what it was, was the Apple Care, was that my computer was under Apple Care. Mm. And Apple Care uh, had just shifted to uh, supporting accidental uh, liquid damage mm -hmm. one month after the accident. Oh, dude. Could you have taken it back a month later? No, it was like I was, I was like a month out from coverage or something. Oh. So it actually is a similar story to yours, but they didn't. They just said there's nothing we can do. And reflecting back, all all my Apple Store customer service experiences have been pretty negative. Hmm. But I've I've mostly been comfortable saying they were my fault. Whereas like it wasn't Apple's fault that I didn't have a phone upgrade and I was embarrassed, you know. Sure. 
It's not Apple's fault that your cat spilled water all over your keyboard. It, yes, although now that I'm sort of, I'm sort of, you can see, you can hear me, listener, sort of remembering all the stuff that I've sort of just forgotten about, <laughs> dredging up this trauma of my my uh, beautiful 2017 touchboard MacBook Pro, which is still sitting in the closet over here. What a shame. <laughs> that computer works. It's just a stupid T1. Yeah, enough. Anyway. Wait, the computer works? Yeah, you can turn it on and it gets to, you can get into recovery mode, but it can't go any further than that because the, oh. I'm pretty sure because the T1 is stopping the process. Because I think the T, because all the coffee went into the touch bar. Oh no. Which I think is where the T1 is. So is the, is the touch bar attached to the logic board or is that like a separate component that you could replace yourself? I don't know. Basically... The 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 upshot of it was I had to replace the the logic board though. right so it was it was it, the cost was basically two hundred dollars less than a brand new uh, version of that computer this sucks which is like no I'm not gonna do it hell no it's okay no I have an iPad what's a computer help computer the the only thing I want to talk about is is um sort of the uh, window dressing I love the dock yeah in the window I know it's really I mean. Apple has always been so that I, I don't actually have it in front of me, but the the sort of like Apple is sort of really excellent at um, you know window dressing and advertising whatever it is that they're they're trying to sell you through the windows of the the store and and I think in in the whatever whatever store Steve is in he's got a this sort of like diorama of OS ten um, probably like you know printed out cardboard but it's all these like layers sort of broken out and it's just this really interesting looking you know uh display of sort of the the functional and aesthetic bits of of mac os 10 to try and draw you in my and favorite just, bit is this cardboard uh dock in the window with yeah. all the app icons yeah and just thinking about all of the the korea i just remember like going to the mall and like every month there would be something new to look at in the window and sometimes like when the ipod comes out they'll they've made like huge ipods with lcd screens that sh- like went through functionality and you hmm. know it just kind of you know these really creative and fun advertisements for the whatever product it is they wanted to sell you at the time. Just to be clear, the uh, cardboard dock is centered in the screen on the bottom, just like Windows 11. Well, that would be the case because, uh, as we'll learn, uh, aligning the dock to the left or right of the screen didn't actually come out until 10.1. Talking or speaking. You got it. You got it. You got it. Speaking of Mac OS 10. <laughs> It's time to talk about Mac OS X. Mm. Talk about Mac OS X. You know, as of as of the Macworld New York 2001, Mac OS X was launched only 116 days ago. Oh, it seems like just yesterday. Love used to be such a simple game to play. <laughs> <laughs> but it's complicated now. There's over a thousand native apps shipping. It's shipping on this bad OS. <laughs> but it's getting better every day, folks. That's right. Over uh, 55% of... Uh, of devs surveyed plan to ship a version of their apps within uh, six months. It may be Microsoft. <laughs> oh, for sure. Because uh, then Steve launches into maybe the the most boring 45 minutes of my entire life, uh, a segment that he dubs... 10 for 10. 10 for 10. 10 apps coming soon to OS 10. And I'm not going to bore you, but I'll give you the highlights. He talks about uh, Microsoft Office on OS 10. Uh Apparently, they redesigned over 700 toolbar buttons. I thought that was uh, insane. Um, big, Adobe, big Microsoft energy. Yeah. Adobe. Uh, Adobe dubs this new era of publishing uh, network publishing. That's the first and last we'd ever hear of that. Uh, <laughs> Quark. Uh, they say that a new version of Quark Express is coming out. <clears throat> um, they're getting the beta ready for now. FileMaker. I have no notes about FileMaker. I don't care. Uh, Connectix. They're going to release Virtual PC on OS X. Windows 95 on OS X, baby! Um, <laughs> International Business Messiah, IBM. <laughs> they talk about their, uh, their, their voice dictation software, and I kind of glazed over a little bit. Uh, moving on to, I think, I think, WorldBook. They're showing some Garbo encyclopedia, some uh, Encarta for Mac kind of thing. 
Uh, I'm not sure why this is in there because this app doesn't look like a Mac OS X app at all. Blizzard is up next. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the guy they got to come out from Blizzard could not care less about Macworld New York. They announced that Warcraft 3 is coming to the Mac. Next up is Aspire. And they're uh, telling us about Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, which is... So I was trying to do some ska. Oh, I see. Yeah. So they're Did talking I do it about right? Tony... Yep. <laughs> Crushed it. Uh, <laughs> skanked so it? This... Yeah, they <laughs> skanked it right up. So they're talking about Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 uh, as if it's something to look forward to. But guess what? It's actually already out. Wow. They bring up Alias Wavefront to talk about Maya, and my immediate thought was, oh, cool, another physics demo. And guess what? It was another physics demo. Whoa. And that's 10 for 10. 10 apps coming to OS X, and it was, uh, yeah, that, that was that segment. Um, that was amazing, Matt. Did you enjoy that? That You, whew, you just blew me away with your, your, uh, your uh, how, how succinct that was. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> So that's other developers, but but what's Apple doing? I mean, nothing. They haven't been doing anything. It's been 116 days. They got nothing to show. 10.04? Yeah. Over 300,000 downloads. Oh, my God. No, Apple's Apple's been busy fixing bugs and working on the next version of OS X. And they announced 10.1. They, they focused on some stuff. Josh, what'd they focus on? Uh, I want to say three main things. Three sort of cornerstones. Performance, mm-hmm. yeah. Performance, Perf- performance. Are you getting it? <laughs> um, yes. Steve claims faster menus, faster window resizing, uh, faster dock, and faster application startup and, and OS startup. Mm. I really enjoyed the um, app launch <laughs> segment. <laughs> I know with with Steve using a, 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 a bounce marks as the uh, criteria. Yeah. So so it. Rather than how long it actually takes to launch an app, he it's he's talking about how many bounces it takes to launch an app. Yeah. So this was a thing back in the day, a, yeah. a sort of a jokey benchmark called bounce marks. Yeah. Still is a thing if you uh, launch certain apps. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Adobe. If you're doing any network publishing. <laughs> so things are faster, but they're also uh, making improvements that are just uh, not just standing still. Uh, there's various improvements to Aqua, yeah, including a quote unquote movable dock. And and w- what this means to us is the dock can be put on the left, the right, or the bottom. Now, what's the right place for the dock? Oh, talk about third rail. <laughs> so I am a I am a bottom of the screen always hide person. Same, which I think is I- appropriate. We have uh, quote unquote system menus, which uh, to translate for modern people is uh, uh, menu bar icons with uh, sort of system configurations like uh, display, uh, display resolutions, uh, things like that. Right. Sound. Yeah. Which I think I think is a sort of analogous to system menus in OS 9. Right. Yeah, I think so. Or the not the system menus, the the little fly out bar thing. Yeah, Yeah. You mean like the control bar? Control strip. Control strip? Yeah. Uh, improved finder? Now, what does this entail, Matt? Uh, so, window resizing is a big one. Uh, it's slow, oh, yeah. as, slow as molasses on 10.0. And- including on column view, which was apparently extremely bad. Yeah. And now Steve, Steve's demoing window resizing, and it's smooth as silk. Mm. Uh, you can now Love do to col- see Steve resize windows. Yeah. You can now resize columns which is something that you couldn't do in the first version. So if you need to see more space in your columns, you can do that. I don't remember what else is in Finder. I think it's primarily the the window. There's certain, there's certain other improvements like uh, CD burning in the Finder and oh yeah, and whatnot. Guess but it's, CD burning now works like it did small in OS 9. Oh, and speaking of that, uh, there's various improvements for the digital hub lifestyle. Mm. Yeah, you got uh, now there's a DVD player. 10.1 will have a DVD player, so you can jam in uh, Toy Story 2 to your combo drive and, uh, you know, watch it. 
Yeah, or yeah. not watch it because it'll crash. <laughs> uh, and, and speaking of that, there's better support for digital cameras. Yes, this is uh, this is maybe the highlight of the keynote for us. I think. <laughs> um, so Steve, after after uh, outlining a few more things like uh, how many PostScript printers OS X now supports, he moves on to a sneak peek of these features, these ten point one features. He shows us the menus. He Shows us the bounce marks. He shows us all the stuff. And he says, why don't I show you what Mac OS X can do with digital photography? Mm, I can't wait. <laughs> can't wait to do it. It's, I mean, it's really going to speed up my network publishing. <laughs> so Steve he, Steve goes over to his Mac and he's got a he got a camcorder plugged into, I assume, USB. Or no, it would have been Firewire. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Um, and uh, it doesn't turn on. Mm. Yeah. And he tries again and it still doesn't turn on. <laughs> And Steve is Steve up until this point is as the most Steve Jobs you've ever seen. Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, consummate showman, consummate Jobs. And after the the camera fails to turn on for the second time, Steve kind of kind of drops the act a little bit. What happened? His face falls. He, he really struggles with the camera for a bit, and you can see him starting to get a little flustered. And then he just turns off stage and he looks at someone and he says, "Did you know how to turn this on?" Maybe an expert knows how to turn this on. And he picks really, up the camera. Really derisive. Yes. Very. Der- you Yes. I'll, just sort of barely veiled rage. Yeah. Uh, and he picks up this camera and chucks it at this guy. And you could tell the guy just barely catches it. Oh, and he chucks it so hard that apparently the batteries fall out. <laughs> and he moves on. Yeah. He's just like, all right, next thing. <laughs> and then he's back. Yeah, it was just this five seconds where you see Steve's <laughs> Steve's game face just fall and you see the real Steve Jobs, the secret Steve Jobs that nobody ever sees. <laughs> but they hear about. <laughs> yeah. You, you get elevator Steve Jobs. <laughs> the one where he shuts down your department. <laughs> the, the elevator um, Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, we're, we're joking about this, but I, I think it is really, really interesting to see because because every time we see Steve Jobs, Steve is, um, you know, he's he's putting us on a little bit. He's 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 got right. a sales pitch. He's trying to convince us of something, and he needs to be charismatic. And it's not often that you see that fall, that facade fall. Well, I, I was I was talking with my wife the other day about the the, the degree to which. Apple demos are staged. Mm-hmm. You know, we're sort of going back and forth on this. And I was saying, well, you know, I, I don't I don't know how to answer this one way or the other today, especially during the age of videos, where it's like obviously it's staged because it's an edited video, right? Right. You mean like the WWDC keynotes? Yeah, yeah. And yep. I would say even even the live ones, like we have evidence of it, you know, it it's live. You know, where it's like, you know, Craig like we said earlier, I don't, I don't know if this, I left this in the show, but you know, Federico, you can't display this, can't demo this feature because he, he hasn't authenticated or whatever, right? Things right. go wrong. Uh, having watched all these old keynotes, like things go wrong a lot, actually, back in the old days. Yeah, and I, and I think we we've seen demos go wrong in the past, and st- we haven't seen Steve no. react like this. Before. No, no, <laughs> he was mad. I've never yeah. seen him lose his, lose his cool like this. Yeah. But he moves on. Yeah, and the, the sort of cap on uh, on ten point one is that it will be a free upgrade. It will cost you twenty dollars for shipping, <laughs> but the software itself, you're not going to have to ding or shell out another one hundred and twenty nine dollars for it, and it'll ship in September. And according to Steve, this is this will when it ships mark the halfway point of the transition to OS ten. He's got a strange metaphor for the transition. To OS 10 being like a 12 hours on a clock. Right. And this will be, we're right now we're at four o'clock and this will be six o'clock. It's kind of hard to follow. Yeah. And I mean, if you follow that logic, I would assume 12 o'clock would be 10.3. And that makes sense because that's when OS 10 got started to get really. But of course he's talking about transitioning all the computers over to shipping with OS 10, right? Uh, as the only OS. Is that what he's talking about there? I thought he was talking about sort of like that's what the transition means into it, as far as okay. I know. Is is like we're moving kind of like today with with ARM, where it's like yeah, we we you know he said it's going to take two years. We're going to transition all of our line over to OS ten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And I think it ends up going faster than than he plans or than he promises. Yeah, 
Which is why people keep saying that the ARM transition is going to go faster than we think. Sure. Speaking of new, speaking of hardware. Speaking of hardware, yeah. Um, Steve gets into the product matrix a little bit. Talks about iBooks. Uh, sold 182,000 iBooks in two months, which is more than any Apple notebook ever sold in any quarter. Any, you know what I mean? Uh, not total, but just in a quarter. They've never sold 182,000 iBooks. Uh, gets a bunch of testimonials up. Gets really psyched that the New York Times likes it. Then he moves on to the power book. Mostly all testimonials gets pretty psyched. The New York Times likes it. Um, then he starts talking about the iMac. And uh, let's uh, let's pour one out for the iMac because this is it. This is it for the G3 iMac. Yes, the final G3. We're, we're back down to the three colors. We're down to... The final G3. <laughs> <laughs> Indigo, graphite, and of course, snow. snow. Yes, we're done. gone are the days of... of flower of, uh, power. and Flower power. Nightmare fuel. <laughs> no, no, no. Tre- trepanation. No, what's it called? <laughs> not trepanation. That's the drilling a hole in your head thing, right? Yeah, that's not much better. <laughs> well, either way. Uh, so these new iMacs are the fastest iMacs yet. Base is 500. You're going to get a 600. You're going to get a 700 megahertz. Yeah, it's pretty simple. You got a low, you got a medium, you got a high. They all come with uh, combo drives or super drives, depending on the one you order. You can order the low and middle range today and the high end one in August. Not a lot to say here. Kind of a uh, kind of a kind of a sad uh, end to the iMac. Yeah, a little bump at the end, but that's it. I mean, there's more iMacs to come, obviously, but that's it. This is the last we'll ever see of the iMac. The iMac dies after this. Next, next, next spot in the quadrant is the Power Mac. Power Mac G4. We just got an update uh, in January, right? Yeah. So sort of uh, small spec bumps in January. Um, This is now the intro of the second generation G4. And uh, they got a cool name for it. Quicksilver. Silver Surf. (laughs) The the Herald of Galactus. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think these are my favorite looking G4s. I don't know about you. There's the three models. These come in uh, 733... 867 and dual 800s. And uh, similarly to the IMAX, the lower two tiers available today and the higher end one available in August. For reference, the base model is $16.99 and the top tier is $34.99. A bargain at twice the price. (laughs) Hey, you can't get a Mac Pro for that these days. (laughs) Uh, Can you get a Mac Pro anymore at all? Yeah. Oh, but, wait, oh, forgot. Okay, I forgot about the cheese creator one. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have uh, five slots of AGP four X graphics, but yeah, right. we, won't hold, we won't hold that against them. Sure. Now it wouldn't be a new Power Mac without a bake off. That's right. And uh, Phil Schiller, senior vice president of marketing at Betty Crocker, is out to uh, get us. <laughs> this this is the favorite. This is Phil's favorite part of the show. I mean, it's really the only reason they drag him out. That's where he feels most powerful. Power, power fill. So we, we stack up in 867 megahertz. This is a single process uh, mm-hmm. power Mac versus a Pentium 4 with a whopping 1.7 gigahertz uh, with the same specs otherwise. Yeah. And they do two demos today and one of them is watching so, video <laughs> render. <laughs> one of them is, a, is like a de-interlacing and encoding process for video. And it, I'm not sure why they thought this was a good idea. I know I understand logistically and, and sort of like philosophically why they thought this was a good idea. But here's, they, here's two quotes from the from the from this from this segment. Quote: <clears throat> "I know the suspense is killing you." <laughs> <laughs> End quote. You can see why people want this to happen as fast as possible. Yeah. So that you sort of have to sit through the Mac rendering the video, and then they kind of kill the demo because yeah. it sucks so bad, and they know it. Like they just wanted to show you. Yeah. The, but you then know. they do another one. And this is and a, it's, it's the classic Photoshop uh, bake-off. Yeah, the, the Photoshop actions bake-off where they have 
uh, all of these actions rendering or creating a Monster Zinc poster. And this one's pretty good. Yeah. Now, now, Matt, while I was watching this, I, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I, I was I was thinking to myself, like, I've watched like three or four of these now. Yeah. And I'm like, I get it. I get it, guys. Like, oh, surprise, surprise, the Power Mac wins. And right. I'm like, I wish that they would... I don't know, say something about this, like why this makes sense or contextualize it more. And they do that. How do they contextualize it? You know, Steve says, he, he says like, you know, I'm always like, when they cook up these bank ops, I always say like, is there any trickery going on here? You know, mm -hmm. he says, no, no, we please these very strictly. We're very careful about this. It basically says like, it's understandable why people are confused because this is a, the, uh, one of these computers has twice as much uh, uh, megahertz power as the other one. Yep. So shouldn't it be twice? Why is it losing? You know, is this like a, is this a trumped up test? You know, he yep. says, no, this is something called the megahertz myth. And he has John Rubenstein come up to uh, explain what he's talking about. This is maybe my favorite part of the keynote. I was so bored at this point. <laughs> I sat through the 10 for 10, 10 for OS 10. I sat through the, <laughs> the video encoding demo and I was about ready to check out and call it a day. And then mm -hmm. John Rubenstein comes up and he's like, hey, um, <laughs> let me let me tell you how computer pipelines work. <laughs> and I don't care no. about how computer pipelines work, but he does such a good job at explaining it so simply. And the and the keynote demo is so well done. I was just like, oh, wow, this is this is pretty fascinating. This makes so, sense. So I don't I don't feel qualified to try to re-explain what John Rubenstein explains here. No, we'll put a time code in the okay. show notes and you can check it out for yourself because nothing we say is going to do it justice because I don't understand how computers work. Suffice it to say that John Rubenstein does a, a, a pretty good job of showing how the process works and explaining why, why a on the surface faster chip has certain architectural trade-offs that make it actually much slower for some or many tasks, right? And he shows why those same trade-offs made in the opposite direction for the uh, power PC are beneficial in Apple's case. And, and I have a note here that says, this architectural trade-off slide is mind-numbing. There is no context here. And then he goes into the, <laughs> into the actual, an actual I, animated I, illustration of how this all works. And it's, it just like, I know. So I got real scared because you were like, oh, you got to wait for this section. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I watched it. He starts by saying, well, chips make architectural trade-offs. They have frequency, pipeline stages, number of functional units, and cache design. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> I know. It sucks. When did, was, when did this suddenly be, become the WWDC State of the Union? Like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> But he, he explains it. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it like after that first slide, I was, cause I was, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm bored out of my mind at this point. And then he gets into the, how the actual pipeline works and the stupid animation of like data moving through an actual <laughs> pipeline yeah, yeah. and coming out the other end as like actual information. Super good. It's so simple. And he's explaining it the whole time. And he's really like, I think I think in a way that Steve isn't, I think he is maybe a little bit more naturally charismatic about about how he's speaking about something he's interested in. Hmm. Um, hmm. He does such a good job and he doesn't like he doesn't falter like the presentation is is flawless. It's absolutely worth watching that five minutes if you're going to watch any of this keynote. It's really good. So John Rubenstein does a good demo and then Steve shows the commercials. And New commercials. He's got three commercials, one of which we've already seen, the middle seat one, which oh, is ter God. terrible. And uh, so so the original video I found didn't have these. And Josh, you found another version out there that has them. So I, I just listened to these and I actually don't remember what any of them were except for that. It's not it's not important. They're, they're, they're sort of, it's, <laughs> it's very rehashy. Um, but the last 20 minutes are important. Hit, hit me with them. Because after the video you sent cuts off, I said, that seems odd. There must be more. So I went and found this new video. And I'm glad I did because even though it's a, it's a much worse quality video, um, after the commercials, Steve comes on stage. He says, all right, why don't I show you <laughs> what Mac OS X can do with digital photography? <laughs> oh, yeah. They have put the batteries back in the camcorder and figured out how to turn it on. 
And they give it back to Steve and he goes up and he gives it one more shot. And there's a tense moment or two <laughs> where he still cannot figure out how to turn it on. And he gets starts to get angry again. But then, okay, whew, he turns it on. Mm. Then Steve gives us a little demo. It's not even that important, but he he wanted to show it. It's it's a, yeah, almost, it. honestly a pretty small section where he just sort of shows. Uh, he basically shows off image capture and like automatically uh, importing photos off the off the camcorder or the camera. Yeah, maybe it's a camera. It's I think it's I don't remember. I don't know about you, Josh, but when I got a digital camera, uh, the first thing I did after I realized image capture was going to import everything automatically was to turn that feature off. <laughs> First thing you did was throw it at someone. And, yeah. <laughs> oh no, my entire life. And I feel like this is true of, of, of many Mac power users is, uh, actually, does this happen in big Sur? What? I wonder. Automatic image import. No, that whole thing where like you plug your iPhone in and then image capture, uh, opens. No, I think they fixed that bug. Bug. <laughs> well, apparently it was a feature. He shows how you can you can go in a matter of seconds from importing photos from your digital device to creating a, uh, a bespoke screensaver using your photo library. Mm. Uh, and the rest of the show is mostly uh, focused on iDVD and uh, a sneak peek at iDVD two and the various features. Uh, Free upgrade. Plus shipping and handling. And this mostly pertains to uh, a feature which Steve is very excited about, which but which made me, uh, I don't know about you, Matt, groan, which is uh, uh, motion backgrounds in DVD menus, mm -hmm. which I feel like was a scourge on society for about 15 years. Not only motion backgrounds in the menus themselves, but you could add motion backgrounds to the buttons in the menu. Oh, but even worse music so uh steve gives us a great demo of of uh, all the new themes in IVD, idvd2 he creates some new menus and picks a great green day song to play nice, on loop nice cat stevens song <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was nice yes steve's favorite theme is, uh, is the family one with the cat mm. stevens song yeah that's that track <laughs> Um, this was a sort of a, a nothing section, but I it had a nice beat at the end where uh, Steve uh, sort of reaffirms a, a theme of his, which is he says, uh, we make things faster. I mean, you know, we love making things faster than yesterday and last month and last year. But the thing we love most is enabling people to do things they could never do before. This is an illustration of Apple standing at the, say it with me. <laughs> Intersection of liberal arts and technology. <clears throat> did you pull up the slide? No, we did not show the street sign, but we we imagined it. Um, and I don't know, maybe I, I thought that was weirdly charming uh, in a, a section which was, from my perspective, kind of boring. Sure. But I liked I liked him at a, at a at the end of a keynote, which was mostly about speeds and feeds. Uh, you know, spec bumps and whatnot. Just taking mm -hmm. a moment to say, like, y you know, this is really what we're here for. Like, like it's good to make things faster, but mostly we want to enable creativity. And you know, that's 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 a marketing line for sure. Sure. Um, but I, I I do think he, I think that was one of his main goals. Well, yeah, with I, computing. I agree. Right. Like he's got the bicycle for the mind quote from the eighties that I think is always sort of like always in the background of all of these things. Right. I think, yes, they're, uh, you know, I, oh, let me take a step back thinking about like Apple computer, like they're a gigantic corporation. One of the biggest corporations in the world, their, their aim is to continue to be a corporation and, and make money. But I think thinking about that, that line about intersection of liberal arts and technology and, and, and thinking about the bicycle of the mind quote, the computer's a bicycle for the mind, like, and thinking about why we enjoy these computers and what we, what we do with these computers. Like, you know, I, I've sort of been thinking in the back of my mind since we started this podcast, why are we starting a podcast about a, a corporation? Yeah. The history of a corporation. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I think about that too. I think there's a tension there. It's like, well, we're sort of like we exist to sort of extol the virtues or, or, you know, it's not, it's not comfortable to be a fan of a corporation, right? Yeah. 
But I, I, I think it, I think what is exciting for me, and, and I think we've talked about this in the past is, is what does this computer allow me to do that I couldn't do otherwise? And it's not, it's not about Apple computer, the company, it's about the products that, that are made that allow me to do the things that I wouldn't be able to do. Mm -hmm. And, and, and certainly like the aspect of Apple that like they're focused on quality and software and hardware and integration. There's like, there's a lot of sort of like um, really interesting ideas wrapped up in Apple, you, you know, this, that are sort of like, you know, that's, that's the people aspect behind the corporation. Uh, people do this because they get to work on these integrated systems and, and make people's lives better through computing. You know, I, I think that's sort of like the interest, but the tension is still there. Like, I guess, I guess my point is like, Thinking about Steve's interest in all of this, we've talked about Apple II was the first hit, but Steve's favorite computer was the Mac, right? And then he came back and made the Macintosh again with the iMac. And then in in ten more, nine more years, he's going to introduce the iPad. And now in 2021, like mm -hmm. the iPad is is probably a lot closer to what Steve's version vision of computing was in 1984. Right. Than it ever has. And it, and I think there's a lot to talk about up, upcoming. <laughs> there's a lot to talk about in the future about that and, and, and how this sort of pans out. Like, I know you use an iPad for editing this podcast. I've been making music on the iPad recently. Like, thinking about what all of this technology enables me to do. Like, I wouldn't be making music otherwise. Uh, I wouldn't be able to edit it or, or, or mix it. Or, you know, you know I, I probably would not be thinking about going out and getting... Um, you know, certainly today I wouldn't be going out and getting some sort of like digital, digital recording device. Like, you know, I think the computer, right. the computer allows me to do so many. Right. The, the concept of a podcast owes its namesake to this time period, right? Sure. Yeah. That's entirely true. So I, yeah. I, I, I don't know if I have a, a button on that other, other than to say, like, I think, I think that's the fascination is, it's, it's not Apple computer as a company. It is. It is how do these computers allow me to do the kinds of things I like to do and allow me to work in the kinds in, in the way that that I that I am comfortable working, I guess. I, I don't know. Or that I enjoy working in. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. I'm just sort of I'm I'm musing on this sort of trying to think about what my take on it is. You know, I, I, I agree with that sort of that discomfort, especially in our own time when the the ills of of capitalism and, and corporation alike are more and more visible to us sure and and apple is in trouble and and making Re trouble regulatorily speaking yeah because uh, i i sort of sometimes feel like it's value neutral what is apple <laughs> yeah like at the end of the day because it's like well they make these great machines which facilitate a lot of good work in the world but they're also making money from that certainly and but, you know, they have all these green efforts to make these computers and they're, you know, carbon neutral or carbon positive or whatever. They're, they're all these great things they're working towards. But also, you know, these poor workers at Foxconn. <laughs> right. You know, sometimes literally killing themselves to make these machines. Right? right. Or like, okay, but, you know, think of the incredible economic value they've brought to the world. You know, not just for themselves, but for others. Okay, but they, you know, they they hide, they 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 shelter all that money in Ireland, right? They don't yeah. pay taxes, right? And it's like for every bad, there's a good, and for every good, there's a bad, right? Right. Today, yeah, anyway, and I just it ends up being sort of neutral, right? Right. Oh, okay, I see what you mean. Yep. Um, and one of the appeals of going back to this time is it, it was like, well, they were struggling, right? They weren't this behemoth. It's enjoyable to go back to this time where they were true underdogs, right? And and sort of celebrate them climbing out of this hole they found themselves in in the nineties, right? Yeah. So it doesn't feel so much like aggrandizing a, you know, a a trillion dollar <laughs> like behemoth. Uh when we when you know we're looking at it at for this time period, although of course it is, right? Because eventually they become that behemoth. Well, and, and I think the other thing to probably or consider is that they're probably doing the exact same things in 2001 that they're doing today, right? Oh, we know that. I mean, we see it time and time again. You know, there's iterations, there's there's fluctuations, but it's the the, the script is the same. No, I, I mean, I mean, I'm thinking about like the ethical concerns of like oh, I see pay, what you're paying the taxes yeah. and 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 exploiting workers and that kind of thing. Like all of that stuff was happening in 2001 for sure. It was not 
a focal point for a a company that is trying to get back on its feet. But and I find myself having this conversation a lot with friends, where, you know, where it's like, well, you know, all these tech companies are bad. You know, Google's mm-hmm. worse on this, Microsoft's better on that, you know, or whatever. And it's like, again, it's just like a lot of a lot a lot of conversations you have around capitalism and trying to live in this world that we live in. It's just like if you, you sort of come out flat. It's yeah. like I don't like. Yeah, this is bad over here, but it's good over there. And I don't. I wish it was different, but I don't know. <laughs> Again, I don't have a button on that. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, I think that's the tension. <laughs> like, like the and there's there's no resolution to that. Like we are talking about. Like we are talking about as as fans of a corporation that makes computers, like we are firmly entrenched in sort of like dis the discussion of capitalism, right? And and I think regardless of our aim, which is which is to talk about sort of like the history of this company and how they were able to sort of produce produce the kinds of things that people enjoy so much and, and, and allows them to be creative, like the tension of um the, the tension of that sort of like capitalism is there right like i i i I don't know how to i don't know how to exist you know it's 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 hard to exist otherwise now because everything is everything is a brand everything is marketed and everything is for sale um well it's hard it's hard to talk earnestly about something you enjoy knowing that the tension exists that like everything is for sale and everything is being sold to. For me, part of that tension is is thinking about like I I'm uncomfortable with the necessary exploitation, right? That has to happen because this is like this is a capitalist company, right? Because you want a new life. Well, not yes, but also like it's not just that I want one, but like how does the iPhone exist without that? And is that a yeah. Is that a good trade, right? Right. And it's not just because I want to look at Twitter, but just like think about all the things that think about the way the smartphone, we'll just leave it at that, has become a sort of like cybernetic part of the human brain. Mm-hmm. And it's this very, this is extension. And this is true of all digital technology, right? Back to the earliest days of computers, like computers are a, the most profound extension of the human form and mind that has ever been invented, right? That's why the bicycle of the mind is a good metaphor, right? Or bicycle for the mind. Um, and those things do not exist without a incredible amounts of uh, collective uh, engagement, cooperation, and technological advancement, yeah. which were all facilitated by <laughs> capitalism and violence, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and, like, and like literal you, warfare, right? And, and, and that that extends to the internet, to all digital te- technology, more or less, and you know, up straight through to the smartphone and you know, social media, whatever, all the things that we have, we enjoy and, and make use of today. And uh, like, I like those things, right? I like right. to have those things. I find them very useful. I feel like they do good in the world, but. They are, I mean, they are to, to put it dramatically, you know, soaked in blood, right? Right. 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 For sure. Uh, and again, no button. I don't know what to say about that. It's just, that is what it is. Right. Yeah. I think that's what I think. I think everything we've just talked about is what makes this hard. And, and, and I mean, it's not hard to talk about Apple, but to examine. Well, it, it's to, easy to treat them like a sports team and be like. Uh-rah, like it's fun to look at the history and be like, it's hey, look at that. They had a great quarter, or you know, they came up with this new uh power Mac or whatever. And it's like, let's look at the features and sort of look at it abstractly and and just enjoy it because you know, we are uh we're enthusiasts and we just enjoy the it for the pleasure of the devices, right? And the mm-hmm. and the um the uh what's what's the word i'm looking for the aspirational nature of these computers right right so what you're talking about with like what not uh, just what are they but what can they do for me what can they as steve's job is saying allow me to do that i couldn't do before right right these are extremely aspirational devices that's why there's so much focus in these years and throughout on creating software for making things right allowing every day uh, quote unquote, mere mortals to create things, right? Yeah. Um, it's extremely powerful. And I, I don't think it's just cynical. 
I, I, I just the sort of thing going through my head is I, I, th- I think, yes, all of that is true. I think where it starts to falter is upon examination, upon the how did we get here? Like, why do these things and exist? How do they exist? And, and how do they exist for me in this world today? Like, mm. what, you know, how did they come to be here? And yes, where is it going? Like, five years ago, I did not have an Apple computer strapped to my body, and now I do. And that's an, that is a, a fascinating shift. Right. Like, and I've heard, I've heard people of late uh, describe Apple, you know, uh, Tim Cook's role as akin to a world leader. And I don't disagree with that. I don't think that's mm. hyperbole. No, I, I agree with that too. Um, so the Apple today is in a very different economic and political place, I think, than maybe that, 2001. Yeah, a space odyssey. Um, <laughs> maybe that's worth They are, some- for every <clears throat> useful definition of the word, <laughs> completely perfect. <laughs> maybe to sort of cap this off, maybe we, we maybe what we're talking about now is worth further examination. Maybe there's an episode in the future where we talk less <laughs> about the products themselves and how these products welcome welcome to our new segment josh and matt's unease about capitalism <laughs> and about ag- aggrandizing a corporation well i i mean I, I we've danced around it a lot and I, I don't think in the last two two years and a couple of months we've really sort of discussed it in this explicitly but no i don't think we have i think yeah. <clears throat> i think we have both been conscious of it we've we have discussed it and I, and I think it's worth further examination. Uh, you know, we're going to have some months where we're not, you know, going to be talking about Apple. And I think it might be worth sort of delving in a little bit deeper into how these products are made. What, what is, <clears throat> excuse me, what is the cost of making these products? Not mm. how much does it cost you to buy an iPhone, but what does it mean to make an iPhone? Yeah. And I, and I think we, we all have some vague ideas around that. Like, and, you know, and how do we, how does the tension between Apple trying to be like a, a green carbon neutral company contrast with the obvious exploitation of Chinese factory workers at Foxconn? Like what, what is all of that? What does all that mean? And, and I don't, I don't know that we'll be able to do that justice, but I think it, it is worth at least us examining further. I agree. I think, I think um, I'm glad we talked about this. I think it was an interesting sort of organic offshoot. Um, yeah. Kind of a weird place to end, but. Yeah, it was a good one. But I think obviously, I think we were both pondering this, right? Yeah. I'm sure we will continue to do so. Okay, well, on that chipper note, <laughs> that's, that's going to do it for July 2001. If you'd like to enter into the discourse with us, you can do so on Twitter. <laughs> oh, good idea. At Mempro Show. Or you could send us a, uh, a screed. <laughs> a tirade. It's a, using the email address, memoryprotectionshow at gmail.com. Or... If you prefer this, you could fruitlessly yell at our website. Or you could listen to some of the older episodes if you're not subscribed. At memoryprotection.show. Recommendations are after the song. Sorry, folks. I know you were all, I know you were all waiting with bated breath for for more Karnoff drama, but uh, we're gonna have to hold off on that for another month. I think. Yeah, we might have something good for you. Karnoff will Karnoff will return, but this month we're back to everyone's fa- favorite segment. Matt talks about Sega Dreamcast games. Yes, welcome back to recommendations. It's a segment where we recommend culture and cultural artifacts 
from the time period about which we are speaking. Matt, what do you got for me this month? Well, it's a little bit of a sad story because, as everybody knows, Sega has announced that the Dreamcast is going the way of the Dodo. Oh, the I can boot, hear the boot. I, I the can boot hear sound. the. I can hear the boot sound. It's very faint this month. So, really, there was nothing for me to report on Dreamcast wise this month. So I had to go back to last month because we didn't do a recommendation. So I thought it was fair game. Uh, Sonic Adventure Two was released. Uh, Sonic Adventure 2, the uh, edgier, more extreme sequel to Sonic Adventure 1. 3D Sonic game, not always everybody's cup of tea. This one introduces uh, Shadow the Hedgehog, the the hedgehog, the dark hedgehog with a gun. <laughs> oh, this is the one? Well, this isn't Shadow the Hedgehog, the game, which is where he has the gun, but I, I believe this is his first sort of intro, and you can kind of play the light story and the dark story. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't love this game. I, I didn't hate it, but I never really, I didn't get into it as much as the first one. It doesn't feel as much like a Sonic game. Does it have chows in it? Ch- chows? Chows. Does it have chows in it? I don't think so. I, it's a much more streamlined experience. Where Why are first... we talking about this game? It doesn't have chows in it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> That's my only interest in, in Sonic Adventure. <laughs> I think that where the first one kind of had like a little bit of like a, open, not an open world, but like a hub world kind of feature, you know, there's a lot more exploration. There's not as much of that as far as I can tell in Sonic 2. It's a much more linear game. The first level is pretty memorable in that you're running down San Francisco's hills and a gigantic, literally a monster 18-wheeler truck starts chasing you. Um, I think that's sort of like Sonic 2, Sonic Adventure 2's uh, whale, killer whale. Oh, equivalent. I see. I, I got what, I see what you're saying. <laughs> I, I have some important mechanical questions about this game. Okay, hit me. So it's got Sonic, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, so can he really move in this one? What do you mean really move? Can he really move? <laughs> like in, in all of the directions you'd want him to move in? Sure, sure. Speed, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Velocity, yeah, okay. Okay, next. Uh-huh. This is, okay, so Sonic. Gotta go fast. Uh, does he have an attitude? Uh, yeah, yeah, he's sassy. Mm-hmm. Okay. He's really, you know, not, he's not your... He's not Mario, you know. No, but okay, but okay, but he's got an attitude, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, okay, so combine those two things. Would, would you say that that Sonic is the uh, w- w- okay, true or false in this statement? Sonic, he's the fastest thing alive. I guess I'm not sure how you extract. Okay, so that. look out. Okay, say say I say say he storms through, and you're looking through. You're looking out. You say, okay. and, you, and you exclaim, "Ah, Sonic the Hedgehog!" Uh huh. Do you doubt what he can do? Sonic the Hedgehog. I, I guess I don't. I'm asking you, Matt. Can he really move, Sonic? <laughs> Sonic, does he have an attitude? Sonic, he's the fastest thing alive. He's the fastest thing alive. He's the fastest thing alive. Song. This is a song, isn't it? Blue streak. Blue streak speeds by. <laughs> is this the Sonic Two theme song? <laughs> <laughs> fastest thing alive is the theme song for the Sonic the Hedgehog animated series. Oh, okay. It was composed by Michael Tavera and performed by Noisy Neighbors. Mm. How many chili dog references are in this song? What happened to Sonic? Think about this. We got Sonic, we got Evil Sonic with a gun in 2001. But in 1996, it's Sonic busting cute bunnies out of robot animals. Like, what happened to Sonic? He lost his attitude. Oh, it's Sonic always had an attitude. I just... I don't know. I'm thinking about Sonic Mania and how good that game is and thinking about Sonic Adventure 2 and how, like, not great that game is. I don't know why I put this in a recommendation. (laughs) Josh, what have you got? Um, (laughs) (laughs) Once again, I'm coming into class at the joint. Okay. Uh, Okay. To be a disclaimer, I don't know when this book was published. It's weirdly hard to tell more often than not what month of particular book was published in. Mm-hmm. It's often not recorded for some reason, or it, it's not recorded on say like Wikipedia or various like, you know, news source. Sometimes you could find like the, the bestseller list or whatever. Anyway, 2001's Bel Canto. And this is a, uh, this is sort of a literary novel about a, uh, it's basically a book about uh, like a Stockholm syndrome hostage mm-hmm. situation. Oh, Okay. I'm bringing this up because this was one of my uh, summer reading books in high school. What? This is like a book I had to read over the summer. That's a weird one. When I was in high school. 
<laughs> and my wife did too. And she hates it. Um, hmm. Do you so love it? I weirdly liked it. Yes. You got some Stockholm syndrome about this book? It's a weird plot. It's um, it's set in an undisclosed or unnamed South American country. And it's at the party at the villa of the president of the country. And they are, uh, it's sort of a, one of the main characters is a Japanese businessman. And they're trying to get him to invest in the country. Hmm. And one of his character traits is that he loves opera. And so they've invited his favorite opera singer to come perform at the show or at the party. And during the course mm -hmm. of the party, terrorists come and uh, take over the party, kill all the guards, and then take all of the party members hostage. Mm -hmm. uh, what ensues is a uh, very dramatic story of uh, the hostages and the hostage takers learning to work together and even fall in love. What? It's a very dramatic book. I think my wife hates it for good reasons, probably. But <laughs> <laughs> when I read this in like... 10th grade or whatever i was like oh this is great this is a good summer read sure it's better than the tale of two cities more like a tale of two shitties <laughs> when you're a jet you're a jet all the way <laughs> to your last cigarette to your first dying day <laughs> that's what that musical is about right tale of two city no that's romeo and juliet what you're talking about um uh west side story west side story yeah that's, that's romeo and juliet Maria, I just met a girl named Maria. Oh, uh, okay. What am I thinking of then? And it's uh, equally dumb as Romeo and Juliet. I don't like that one. I'm not a fan of It's a bad story. I like A Midsummer Night's Dream. I also like The Tempest. I'm going to recommend The Tempest. Forget Sonic Adventure 2. <laughs> We're going back to the year 14, William Shakespeare's 2001 classic. 1521. The <laughs> so... You got anything else on Bel Canto? It sounds interesting. Um, uh, last thing about Bel Canto is I, uh, it was a book that got borrowed out, right, to all the kids. And mm -hmm. I never gave my copy back. I stole it. And to this day, it weighs heavily on my conscience. Do you still own it? You know, we just organized, over the pandemic, we organized all our books because it was a total mess. There was no system. And my dad had built me a new shelf. So he said, it's time. And so we organized mm. all of the books into different categories. We had science, science fiction, fantasy, children's, and we had we had um, lit lit and pop lit. Mm. And my wife and I had a, a a a short argument about where Bel Canto should go. <laughs> where did it end up? I think it went into pop lit. I think. Yeah. Actually, she wanted to put it in the donation pile. <laughs> yeah. But I said no. You can't donate Bel Canto. I stole this book fair and square. <laughs> so I stole this book. <laughs> I um. Look, one final piece of color on that is I, uh, today I had to do some errands for my family and I, on the way back, I, uh, I, I thought to myself, I'm going to pass the high school and I know that they, they recently rebuilt the high school, but I had, it, I had, no, I, 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 down? <laughs> my high school was, um, garbage. Oh. In, in, sorry, in terms of like the physical structure, I said sure. the teachers are great, 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 great education but the building was a built in the 70s in a sort of open plan style mm. open concept style so it's like everything was huge open rooms and what that meant what that in effect meant was that all the classrooms were like partitioned off and so you could always hear everything oh. that was going on in every class all the time yeah my middle school was like that it was off it was it was like a maze a rat maze i had a yeah. dream yesterday that i had to go back to high school and had a nightmare about not knowing where my classes were. <laughs> Literally yesterday, I had this nightmare. And then you went there today. And then I, I don't, yeah, it's weird. Like I was, I made, that's probably why I went, right? I wasn't thinking about it like that, but brains are weird. Um, mm. So I said, I, I haven't seen the new high school. And I said, I, I'm not sure. I've always like stayed away from the place because I, just, I didn't want to go back there for various reasons, whatever, you know. But I was like, I've been avoiding it. And I was like, I, I, I was kind of sort of unclear on what the state of it all was. It's like, is the new school ready? Is the old school still there? Whatever. So I was like, let's just fuck, screw it. Let's do it. I'm just going to go on my way home. So I drive in there and I go in the back way and it's like, oh, okay, here's the old football field. There's the commissary from the old base. You know, a, this all looks familiar. And then suddenly it all changes. It's all suddenly like very alien. Hmm. And on the left, where my high school was, is now just a football, a new football field. Classic. And it's just gone. Wow. 
and I could see in the background the hill where I used to go meet for cross country. And then mm-hmm. on the right is the new school, completely brand new, fully operational, um, witness the power. Yeah. And it was a uh, truly, truly bizarre, like hmm. truly alienating experience. Yeah. And I said to myself, well, I, uh, I guess that copy of Bel Canto is mine now. <laughs> guess I don't have to pay the library fines on this one. <laughs> I can finally graduate. <laughs> <laughs> well, your college degree is null and void because you never got your diploma. Because That's what my Canto. dream was about. Is I was I was already a college graduate, but they were like, no, you have to go back to high school <laughs> to take these classes. Oh, boy. <laughs> Oh, man. That's my hairy dog story. Huh. I went to two high schools. They tore one of them down, rebuilt. Just for just for fun? No, I mean, it was old. I think it was from the 50s, and they tore it down in the 90s. Oh, damn. And, and rebuilt another one. That's old, old. Yeah, and the second one, I think, was built. I don't know when it was built. I was just on their Wikipedia page the other day. Built Probably similar time. Let me, let me hang on. My history. Nope, that's not it. But yeah, 1958. Wow. Yeah. It's the same high school that was there and they built, they built additions onto it, but yeah, it looked like a school from 1958. Well, we really crushed this uh, recommendation segment, Josh. Yeah. I mean, lots of ups, lots of, ups, lots of downs, lots of, lots of great uh, recommendations. And uh, I'll just leave the listeners with this final word. If we shadows have offended, think but this and Stop. all is mended Stop. that you have but slumbered here. Well, these visions did appear. And this week an idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. Gentles do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend, else the puck a liar call. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. I think that... Those famous should... lines by Stanley Tucci. 